Discover hope and healing from the other side. Welcome to Messages of Hope with Suzanne Giesman. Listen, they're all around you, close as a thought or a memory. Messages of Hello, everybody. Another live show for you with an incredible guest today. I am so pleased that she said yes when I asked her to let me interview her because the topic is channeling, which, of course, is near and dear to my heart and to many of yours as well. If you don't know much about it, you will by the end of the hour. Let me bring her in. She is Helene Wabe. Helene, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here with you talking about this topic that we both love so dearly. Absolutely. And I can't imagine a more perfect person to talk about it. I, I could read your background, but I'll just do a brief introduction, then I'd love if you expand on it. You're the director of research for the Institute of Noetic Science, which many people recognize as IONS, and a highly respected organization it is, as I was reading your biography, I thought to myself, they must just be over the moon to have somebody with your cred credentials doing the work you're doing. So why don't you share with us first what those credentials are? Thank you so much. Yes, so I am actually clinically trained as a naturopathic physician. So I have a background in a general practitioner. I was so curious about health and healing, especially how the mind influenced the body. So I got my medical degree in naturopathic medicine and had a private practice, worked with patients for quite a bit, and then became really uh, deeply interested in the research aspect. My curiosity got the best of me and I wanted to study the connection between the mind and the body. So I went uh, back to school and I received two postdoctoral research fellowships. I got a master's in clinical research and focused on meditation and mindfulness meditation and how that could help uh, people with stress, with post-traumatic stress disorder, had a National Institute of Health grant to look at combat veterans with post-traumatic disorder and teaching them mindfulness. So could, I, could, could I interrupt you just a second there? Very quickly, if you could just turn your volume down a little on your computer, we're having a little bit of warble. And I, now that you and I are talking a lot, I can hear it a little more. But I was so impressed by that with, with my military background that you spent five years studying and hopefully helping combat veterans with PTSD. I'm just, it's a little bit of a, an aside from our main topic today, but what were the results of that for the veterans? Yes, is this, uh, is the feedback better now? Much better, thank you, yeah. Okay, great. So yes, that was a fascinating study. We basically had over, um, just over 100 combat veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder, and we randomized them to one of four groups. Uh, mindfulness meditation, mindfulness plus slow breathing, a slow breathing group without mindfulness, and then just a sitting quietly, which was our control. And so the goal was to see how uh, meditation could support these veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder, but also try to tease apart what was happening during the mindfulness. Because we know slow breathing is also uh, therapeutic because it helps trigger the parasympathetic or rest and relax part of our nervous system. So what we found was that the uh, active groups actually all had improvements in post-traumatic stress disorder. So it wasn't just the mindfulness that improved symptoms. But what was fascinating was that the people in the mindfulness meditation groups, their relationships to their symptoms shifted quite a bit more. So if they had a re-triggering or they had a hyperarousal or they had symptoms that were rising up for them, they weren't so concerned about it and it didn't take them down this spiral of increased symptomology, guilt and shame and beating themselves 
up over it, they were able to just view their symptoms as they were. So that was a really wonderful study and it was amazing to work with the combat veterans and learn how to support them, even if it was just for 30 seconds to practice that mindfulness, that meditation, uh, giving those micro baby steps to get into that place of stillness and quiet for them. Well, we may have to get you back on the program and do a whole hour on just that topic, because I know that so many of the people who watch this program are dealing with trauma from the death of a close loved one. And so yeah. I know that what you learned there and what you know already could really help them. But today's topic is based on your recent book, which is called The Science of Channeling, Why You Should Trust Your Intuition and Embrace the Force That Connects Us All. I love Love, love that subtitle. I just was told, I got a little hit here intuitively. I didn't let you finish your credentials. I jumped ahead. What is, is there anything that you'd like to add to that? Yes, well, what's fascinating is because you hear my background and you know degrees and training and all this, it's like, wait a minute, why is this person writing a book on channeling? And yeah. so, you know, what I don't share in my usual bio is that, you know, I've had trans channeling in my family that I experienced from a very, very young age. And I would go to my grandparents' house uh, for what they called meetings, but I now know or we're, we're basically spiritualist seances where my grandmother, my uncle would go into trans channeling states and bring forth a variety of of different characters bring so many different messages and these happened weekly for you know decades so this and was that, just normal for you Excuse it was me. just normal and it was um profoundly affected my worldview and yet it i i you know inherently knew that okay it was normal for me but it wasn't normal in the world and that this was a very unique situation. I didn't really talk about it with people. I didn't uh, include it in my academic career world. I didn't openly talk about it because I knew of the taboos for going into that. So I, as a meditation researcher, I received an invitation through um, connections with friends, actually, to go to a work group at IONS, which was looking at meditation research, how it was done, and what was kind of being limited in terms of how the West was researching it. So I was invited to this Future of Meditation work group, and I was like blown away by the work that IONS was doing. I hadn't heard of them before, and I was so excited about the research questions they were asking and the courage that they had to go out on a limb to study these fringe topics. And that inspired me to inquire about joining their team. And fast forward a couple of years, I was invited to join as a consultant and then an employee. And now as director of research, I really get to merge my personal experience with my rigorous research background to ask research questions about channeling. What is it? How does it work? How can we use it? And so that's what I've been focused on for the last eight years, the Ions of Channeling Research Program, which then led to the Science of Channeling book. Wow. Well, it's, it's a fascinating book. I love reading it because it validates so much of my personal experience, but also what I tell others. And you answer so many questions that people have. But what is very interesting to me is that your definition of channeling is very broad. Many of the people who are watching know that I do trans channeling with my guide Sanaya, but that's not all that I do. And you use channeling as an umbrella. I'd, I'd love if you share for everybody your definition for this book and in general of what channeling is. Yes, it, I do use a very broad umbrella definition. And that was one of the most striking thing I found when I started working at IONS and in this field of parapsychology was the number of terms and meanings and definitions. You know, what I called a medium, someone else called something else. And people use different definitions for the same terms. So it was definitely a challenge 
to think about what do we call this experience that so many of us have of uh, receiving or accessing information that goes beyond our traditional five senses. And so I created this umbrella definition of channeling, which is this process of accessing information and energy from beyond our tr conventional notion of time and space, and that can appear expressive, but also receptive. And so that's a broad umbrella that includes many, many experiences that many of you may have had that exists on a spectrum. It includes things like gut hunches or um, general intuition. I just know it or I just felt it. And it also includes things like mediumship and trans channeling on the other side of the spectrum and everything in between, precognition or mind over matter. There's so many words that we ascribe to the experience of knowing beyond time and space, knowing beyond our traditional five senses. And I'm proposing that all humans have the capacity to channel and that the way it shows up for us is unique. So I may have certain care, I get goosebumps, I feel it in my body, I get downloads, I've learned how to trans channel. Someone else may see auras or see colors or hear uh, uh, their guides speaking to them and it all looks very different and that's okay. There's no one right way. There's no one way that's better than another way. It's uh, really an invitation to explore our unique what we call noetic signature of channeling. I, I love that because right now I know that everybody listening or watching is saying, well, then what I've been doing here and what I've been doing there is channeling. And it's true. So it's not in, in your definition. It's not just going into a trance or deep state of, of meditation and bringing through guides. It's all of those things you mentioned. Now, yeah. noetic signature, if you would break that down into both parts. First of all, what is noetic? Because you are director of research for the Institute of Noetic Sciences. And then what is each person's noetic signature? Yes. So noetic comes from the Greek word that means uh, gnosis, that means inner knowing or inner wisdom. And IONS was founded by Edgar Mitchell, who was an Apollo 14 astronaut who went to the moon. He was the sixth person to walk on the moon. On his way home from the moon, he had this incredible transcendent state where he felt part of the stars and the earth, the sun, everything, and that it was all part of him. And he was an engineer. So he had never experienced anything like this before. He came back to earth and said, I wanna study what this interconnectedness is, what this inner, connection is and called the Institute, the Institute of Noetic Inner Wisdom Sciences. And so that's where noetic comes from. And then signature really refers to this unique aspect that we all have. It's like a fingerprint, the way that we express what I believe is an innate ability to channel. Now, We've done, um, and you might say, okay, why are you creating a whole nother term to use to apply this? And you're right. It is another word. Maybe it's going to confuse things. And yet there is, as many of you know, still taboos around the word channeling. And perhaps this term noetic signature may allow it to reach some audiences that might feel uncomfortable with the word channeling. So we've done a number of studies on this noetic signature, people's innate abilities and experiences of channeling. And we have, you know, let the data drive our research. And what's the data? It's, you know, the first study was over 500 people writing out how they experience accessing information and energy from beyond time and space. So we let go of all the terms and we just said, what's your experience like? What do you, what actually happens? What does it feel like? What's going on? And we did a qualitative analysis of all that 
information and came up with 350 themes and sub themes. Wow. And we, I know we get, we whittled that down to 175 and then we sent that out to over a thousand people around the world and said, can you please answer these and see if they've happened to you? Then we took those 175 items from the over thousand people, put it, uh, through a statistical model to explain what's the variation of this data. How can we pull out themes? And we came up with 12 characteristics that defined uh, how people experience channeling. Now, there are nuances in there, and so you might say, okay, well, what about this one or this one or this one? Um, these 12 characteristics were the strongest to define uh, most of the variation. And so what's fascinating is they do line up with some of our traditional terms. For example, the largest one was around general intuition. So I just know it. People will say, I just know it. I get this download of information. When I meet someone, I have all this information that I know about the person. Um, or I just feel it in my body. There's also um, a separate characteristic that's just for mediumship and, you know, the apparent conversations with non-physical beings, mediumship and trance channeling. There's one for dreams. Many people receive their information while they're sleeping. So that was another characteristic. There's one for healing. There's another one for using visualization to affect the physical world, but also to receive information. So this might be clairvoyance, remote viewing, mind over matter, or psychokinesis. So I could go on about those, but there are the 12 different characteristics that we then use to create an inventory of 44 items where people can take this and see where their um, experiences lie on all 12 of these and perhaps use it as a learning tool to explore which one is you know exciting to them that they want to strengthen or which one is more common for them so we've really enjoyed this noetic signature inventory development and process as a way to uh, bring this to the masses if you will in a very accessible way are the results of that available now at noetic.org Yes, we've published two papers on that, and the inventory is available for people to take through a research study, oh, wow. and we will shortly be rolling out a public-facing website where you can take the inventory and you get your report and an exploration guide to explore the 12 characteristics. That's awesome. I love it. Not just research, but practical application, and everybody can get involved. Yeah. That's what I love about yeah. IONS. So. This is very interesting that you are both a scientist and a channeler yourself. I know you must have a personal opinion about mediumship and is it real and can it be proven? What is the official answer to that? Yes, I often joke about, you know, okay, now I'm going to put my scientist hat and answer that question. And then now I'm going to put on my personal hat and answer that question. I bet, yeah. So, How about both hats then? Yes. So let's start with the scientist hat. Many, much of your audience may know that there have been multiple rigorous triple blind studies evaluating mediums' ability to access accurate information about deceased humans that really it's difficult to explain in other ways. Now, um, and there's a, a wealth of studies demonstrating this. Our team and others around the world have looked at the accuracy of mediums to be able to get information. They've also looked at physiology, what's happening during um, the sessions in the body of the medium. One interesting study we did looked at EEG, and we found, which are brain waves. So we found an interesting difference in the brain waves when the medium was giving an accurate answer 
about a deceased person versus an inaccurate answer. Well, so that was really fascinating. Wow. Our most recent study looked at mediums and non-mediums and asked them uh, to look at, I think it was about 200 pictures of deceased people. And they had to discern how they died. They were given four different causes. It was either a heart attack, car accident, I think it was shooting, and one more that I'm not remembering in this moment. And so we had hypothesized that the mediums would be um, more accurate at guessing the cause of death compared to the controls, which were you know just general people who didn't claim any mediumistic abilities. Um, but I would I would correct that word guessing to discerning because the real medium. Yes, won't thank guess. you. Sorry, discerning. <laughs> thank you, discerning. And so what was fascinating about that was that the mediums did discern above chance the cause of death, and so did the controls. So both the controls and the mediums were actually able to discern the cause of death above what we would expect at a chance level. And that's in your book. I, I read that in your book and it really surprised me. Yes. How do you uh, interpret that? For me, it actually supports my hypothesis that we all have channeling ability. Isn't so, that what I say to everybody, you guys? <laughs> I know. So yeah. these controls were actually, you know, performed quite well. Even yeah. though they didn't think that they had those abilities, they were able to do it. And then, you know, some mediums might say, well, that, you know, perhaps we as a group should be better than the general public in terms of our scores. And yet this was a contrived experiment in a laboratory. The right. design was very different than how mediums normally interact. You know, you don't see 200 pictures of deceased people. So um, it wasn't set up to replicate kind of what a normal mediumistic session looks like. Um, but regardless, they still scored above chance as well. So that was a really fascinating study. And we just received funding to do this experiment on a global scale with many more participants. Wow. It's going to be online instead of in the laboratory. So stay connected on our website because we'll be looking for participants and maybe you could join us in that. That's awesome. And she means everybody watching, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So back to the original question, though. So, you know, I feel like there is uh, significant evidence that mediums can get accurate information about deceased humans. Now, the biggest argument against that is that they are somehow, instead of communicating directly with that deceased human, that they're telepathically picking up that information. Now, with my scientist hat on, I say, well, that's still pretty incredible if that was the case you know, that they could telepathically pick up this incredibly disparate, you know, unknown information that they would likely need to gather from multiple different sources around the world to pull forth. So I try not to engage too deeply in that conversation. And again, with my scientist hat on, it is, um, in my opinion, not really possible to definitively prove with prove in quotes uh, non-physical beings existence with the tools that we have today, like objectively and excluding other psi phenomenon as an explanation. Okay. You, That's you what just my dropped that. Is on. that was perfect. You just, you just dropped. Oh, so you, you dropped that word psi in there, P-S-I. Are you going to tell us after a definition of psi, your personal definition, your personal? Sure. Interpretation. Okay. Let's hear that first. Then we'll go to what psi is. So what yes. does, what does Helene Wabe say about mediumship without the hat on? Yes. So that was my scientist hat. We can't prove in quotes. Personally, you know, from a young child, I have witnessed my relatives trans channeling. 
you know, and, you know, trans channels believe they are acting as vehicles for non-physical beings to speak through them, whether it's deceased humans or other non-physical beings. And I know my family. Why would they make this up? There's no motivation. They weren't getting paid. They didn't have a mental health illness. There was no pathology. They were highly functional. And they would completely change their voice, their mannerisms, their speech, the information that they were speaking about. And I don't know, I've seen at least hundreds, if not a thousand trance channeling sessions over my lifetime. And I believe that it's true that there are non physical, multi-dimensional beings that we can be in communication with. And so that's definitely a personal bias that I have that I own uh, when I do my research. I Where love I try that. To be more neutral, yes. Yeah, I love it. Uh, we could dive into, you know, why can't, why don't more scientists accept that? But you're, it's all in your book and it's very well laid out there. But Let's get back to what's really relevant for those who are watching or listening right now. So how about this one? How common are channeling experiences? So if we look at channeling experiences with the umbrella definition, it is incredibly common. So we've done multiple studies now through surveys asking people if they've had channeling experiences. And we have about 25 different ones laid out. And we did one fascinating study where we asked um, about 900 people in three groups, scientists and engineers, people from the general population in the US, and also we called enthusiasts who were the IONS members. And we asked them, have you had any of these experiences? And the numbers were huge. It was like over 90%. And that just completely blew us away. So we looked at our items and we said, well, maybe people got confused and they thought this, the question about clear empathy or feeling other people's emotions was just normal empathy. So there are a few questions that could have been misconstrued. So we took those out and it was still above 80%. Hmm. So imagine going in, you know, to a room with 10 people Eight, at least eight of those people would say yes to having at least one channeling experience in their life. And so often, you know, people are afraid to share about this because they think it's rare. They think, oh, I must be alone in my experiences. And that's so completely false. And these studies have been done around the world by other investigators. And the the numbers range. Um quite a bit, but they are common, common, common. They are not rare. And what I found fascinating in your book, The Science of Channeling, I love this book, is that you found that scientists and we would normally call left brain people were just as likely to have had these experiences. Yes, in this anonymous study, so they didn't have to tell us who they were, they endorsed having these experiences at some point in their life. So that was quite remarkable to us because we had hypothesized that it would be less. There are so many taboos in academia. We said, well, maybe they just aren't having those experiences. And so that's why, you know, they're shunning them. But in fact, they are. And that's reinforced by the number of emails that we receive from scientists who are really interested in this work, but are afraid to step forward because they lose their tenure, they lose their funding, they're afraid of what people might think of them. So there is definitely a very large undercurrent of support for this work that is um, not yet, doesn't feel quite safe for many people to have it be revealed. Well, with your work, we'll get there. And many of us. Yeah, Yeah, courageous enough to say, you know, you need to step forward and speak your truth. I love that. Yeah, and that's what really inspired me to write the book because, you know, I envision it being this resource where people say, look, look, I'm not alone. Like, you know, we can show this. There's evidence for this. 
Yes. Check this out because, you know, when I started at IONS, I had no clue. There was a hundred, over 150 years of research that's been done on these phenomena. I had no clue that that even existed. And so many people just don't realize, they say, oh, that's just not studied or we don't know or that's fake or whatever. It's like, actually, look, we have yes. so much evidence for this. Check oh, yeah. it out. And, and re- reputable with people with PhDs, these institutes of psychic research have been doing these for, yes. like you said, over a century. Wow. So hope for the future in accepting it more. I'm seeing it with your work and with people becoming more open to it and with the media just going up like this, that uh, someday we can say at dinner parties, I'm a medium and people won't just suddenly become quiet. Right, right, right. Maybe, you know, five, 10 years from now, we'll have another interview and we'll be like, oh, remember when, you know, not anymore. That's Mm -hmm. right. So I think, that the practical applications are really going to drive that. I mean, there's so many things that we have in our world that we don't understand how they work. Nobody really does, but it does. And it provides us with ease or comfort. I mean, we all walk around with smartphones now. We have no clue how that works, but it does. So, you know, when the practical applications continue to increase for um, the usefulness of these skills, I think, Personally, I think that's what's going to really take it over the edge. Well, I feel that the personal usefulness that people don't realize is they turn to their cell phones first now instead of turning within. I would love to know your personal experience with unseen helpers or guides, as most people would know it. Do you interact with your own guides? Yes, I do. I have my own channeling practice that I practice regularly. Um, when I was younger, I was very sensitive to people's emotions, to their physical pain and suffering. I would get downloads. I would get goosebumps when I experienced something that resonated with me as truth. Uh, as I grew older, I developed a strong connection with my spirit team, I call them, and can't imagine living my life without that support from the invisible realms. That's I have sure. a very strong meditation background and practice that has been a tool that supported me to get to that clear and quiet place so I can hear and listen. I've been shown over and over and over again in decision making in my life. Um, that I have access to resources and support that go beyond the physical that have really guided and helped me um, to really make my life so much more easeful and fulfilling and meaningful. And so, so the short answer is yes, absolutely. And I'm a huge proponent of people developing their own channeling abilities in whatever way works for them, whether that's hiking in nature or, you know, using tools or trans channeling or whatever it is. And I have since learned how to trans channel because one of my colleagues developed a hypnosis protocol to teach people who didn't know how to do it to do it. So when I started at Heinz, I'm like, I really want to learn how to do that because I'm studying this. I might as well learn it. My family, of course, had done it. So I thought maybe I had a propensity to do it. And uh, through that, I was able to learn and choose. If I choose to, I can trans channel if I would like as well. I love that. And it's such a beautiful feeling, isn't it? Oh, yeah. this, this reminds me of a question I had, I had to ask you because I read it in your book and it validated an experience of mine that when channeling, you need to drink more water. If I don't drink water after I bring through my guides and do a channeling session and go to bed right away, I get a massive dehydration headache. Uh, Cannot drink wine after channeling because I'm already dehydrated. What's up with the needing more water when you channel? That's a great question. You know, I can only guess at the mechanism for that. There are so many biochemical pathways in our body that are dependent on water for completion. So that's what comes to my mind in terms of the why for that. 
The other thing that I personally experience, and I'd love to hear your take on this, is minerals and trace minerals, that the channeling process kind of burns out minerals. Um, you know, we still don't know quite how it works. And um, there is a physical effect in my experience, even though it may not be only physical in terms of how it works. Oh, well, I don't know anything about that. This is fascinating talking to you because you are a naturopathic doctor, a physician. Your background is just fantastic for this work. But I had a healing session with a dear friend about a month and a half ago, and she recommended I get some trace minerals and add them to my water. And I have the bottle sitting downstairs and I haven't used it. And that's why I looked a little surprised when you said that. So maybe I should start adding little drops to my water and see what difference that makes. A little self-science, perhaps. Yes, yeah. yes, absolutely. I would love, I mean, here's my wish, that we can move beyond trying to prove whether it's real or not so we can get, it's like, let's just set that question aside for now. We don't because, have the tools yeah. right now to figure it out. Let's get into the nuances. Does trace, do trace minerals improve the health of mediums and trans channelers? Because it's, you know, replenishing somehow what's shifting. I don't know. That's fascinating. So I am teaching a course with the Shift Network now, and I just sent out an announcement to everybody that to let them know you have a class coming up with the Shift Network. And I would love if you share with everybody what it's about. There's a link to more information about that class in the description of this on the YouTube channel and on Facebook. But what are you going to be teaching everybody? Thank you so much. Yes, that class starts March 1st, and you can register for that now. It's based on the IONS Channeling Research Program and the book, and it looks at a variety of questions about channeling. So how common is it? Who can do channeling? Is, it channel, is channeling real? Uh, what can we get from the content? How does it work? These various questions, I go through each que uh, a question, a module, and we go more deeply into all of the research that has explored that question in a very, very accessible way. So you hear how I'm talking today. It's not super sciencey. It's very accessible for people, the general um, public, to understand what the studies are about and such. But it really is aimed to offer you support and resources to feel confident and nurtured in your experiences. Each module has a lecture portion and then I guide people through a half hour experiential. Nice, yeah. And then we have a half hour of question and answer. And there are seven sessions and lots of bonus modules and bonus materials through the Shift Network. Cool. So I'd love any of you to join us on that exciting journey. Cool. And I think the link that's on my program here it takes you to the free event that the Shift Network always does before class. So click the link just for the free event. And if you're interested in the class, it's an excellent opportunity because they're getting more and more into classes like these, which we yeah. love, of course. So yeah. how about advice for people talking to others about channeling you know we know it's real we do it those most people who are watching now have had their own experiences how do we get that conversation going and feel comfortable with it i know how but i love to hear what other people say yes it's a great question and it's such a challenge for people you know often i will have people emailing saying you know i've never shared this with anybody before I'm sharing it with you. Thank you so much for your work. And once they start feeling heard and acknowledged, then often they're really excited to start spreading the word about it. And I think there's a, a balance between preaching to and engaging in conversation with. Yeah. And so, you know, there's often a feeling your audience, you know, is this someone who is you know, very rigid or doesn't have these kind of exploration energies in other parts of their life, or are they perhaps curious? And often just a 
probing question, even using the word intuition or, or a word that perhaps may not be so charged is a nice way to begin the conversation. Or, you know, have you ever had a gut hunch that came true? You know, have you ever had a dream that gave you some information that you were able to use in your life? Those are very gentle opening questions that can often engage people. And based on their response, you know, if they're like, no, and shut down, it's like, push, let it go. That's right. You don't need to be a martyr and open yourself up to abuse if the person's not into it. And there's no forcing or coercing or persuasion uh, that needs to happen. But more often than not, you get, yeah, you know, I had an experience like that. And then they get excited to share about their experience and you can share about yours. And then it becomes this fun dialogue or exploration together. And you can then say, well, did you know there's actually quite a bit of research on this already? And you know, direct them to resources if they're interested in learning more. For me, the biggest take home message is you are not alone. Amen that there is so much information to support you if you want to feel supported in the, in the research and or if you want to nurture those abilities to support you in your own life. Wonderful. Beautiful. I want to ask another question or two. I know you, you're a busy lady. You have another interview that you have to move on to. But before you go, what are some of the most exciting discoveries or maybe just the top one that's come up in your work that you didn't know or didn't expect, being that you came into this with a great background in it already? I think the funniest one, you know, I came into this very naively into the research world of it, thinking there's got to be one way that it works. You know, like I'm going to figure out how channeling works. And it's going to be just one clear mechanism. And what I quickly am learning is that there probably isn't just one mechanism, that depending on the person and the type of channeling, that there's probably many different ways that channeling occurs. But that perhaps um, the fundamental nature of reality, which I think we're going to quickly um, find enough evidence for is all interconnected yeah. support uh, the various ways that sh channeling shows up, but that perhaps the different ways that it shows up actually have different mechanisms. So maybe trans channeling has a way that it works and maybe precognition has a different way that it works. But underneath that is this interconnectedness oneness but that those specific ways might be different. So my naive bubble got burst and uh, there's a lot more work ahead of me to figure out those various ways that that channeling works. I love that. Then we're not restricted and it, it's more like learning about how limitless we really are. Yeah. In fact, what you just said, that's Ion's basic premise, isn't it? The interconnectedness of all of us. Yes, that everything is interconnected. That to me is this spiritual side of the science that you dive into. Do you want to address that for a second? Yeah, so Ion's guiding premise is that everything is interconnected and that embodying that awareness allows us to access information and energy from beyond our conventional notions of time and space. And that in turn profoundly amplifies well-being, innovation, and transformation. And so you can look at that in three parts, and the core of it is this interconnectedness. Now, what's fascinating is there are different disciplines that are finding that that is true. So you look at quantum physics, and I'm definitely not a physicist and can only speak to this at a very surface level, but there have been numerous experiments done now on something called entanglement. So you can take two photons of light and entangle them in a specific way in a laboratory, take one halfway across the world, and those 
two photons are still intrinsically linked such that if you turn one a certain way, the other one will instantaneously turn the same way. There's no space and time. They're just instantaneously connected. And this has been demonstrated in multiple labs with even larger molecules like small diamonds or what are called buckyballs or these larger um, molecules. And they even found, MIT recently found that uh, quasars, which are like light from billions of years ago, were entangled in this same way. So if you think about us all originating at the big, big Bang, we were all connected at some point, and perhaps we're all still entangled in this way. If there's any quantum physicist listening to this, I deeply apologize for yeah, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> not very well. Last October, the Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded for these experiments yeah. that took place decades ago for exactly that, experiments in yeah. entanglement. And this is what those who dive into uh, the inner world have known all along because we have the personal experience of that interconnectedness. So yeah. I love the work that you're doing. Any final words for us, Helena? I would just leave the audience with an invitation for exploration of their own unique, beautiful ability to channel and that there is no one right way to do so, to invite you to bring an attitude of loving kindness and compassion to yourself in this process and to embark, if it feels right to you, if you don't have a practice already, on small micro practices even if it's just a couple minutes a day, uh -huh. choosing something, anything that brings you into a place of stillness, internal stillness and presence, and explore your ability to discern. Start with a yes, no question and just see what happens. And to also set the intention, make a commitment of your will again, if it feels right to you, to strengthen your channeling ability to step into that path for yourself, knowing that there's so much evidence that it brings greater meaning, improved quality of life, and ease and support as you uh, unfold that journey for yourself. So deep gratitude to you all, and I'm just so excited for you as you embark on this adventure. And that it is an adventure. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Helena. Your energy, I was looking forward to feeling it personally. It comes through the book beautifully, yet it is a, just a, both an academic and a how-to book. And in person, it just adds even more. You just uh, have a beautiful light that I'm so grateful you bring to IONS and to all of us. So thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. All righty. Well, everybody, thank you for joining us today. If you want more information on how to get just a couple minutes of practice in a day, check out my video, Sip of the Divine, if you're not familiar with that yet. Right on my homepage, you'll see my latest events. And down at the bottom is a free resource guide on where do I begin to uh, get more tools, to discover these great channeling abilities that Helene was talking about. So be sure to check out her book. I really, really enjoyed reading it, and I know you will too. So in the meantime, hope you go out and have a great week, and we will see you next week. I'm doing a Q&A session talking all about the afterlife, our favorite topic, right? So have a great one. I'll see you back here next time. Mm -hmm.